Oh, do you feel? Homeless gifts can wreck my day. Cyber sales steals my orchestra. And Sony Youth in my cola. Get out of there, you kid. Oh, come on, Mrs. Frampton. You're not going to eat all that watermelon. See, I'm trying to perform. Dr. Bones, Dr. Bones, Dr. Bones. This is Dr. Bones live for part two of my interview with the Gypsy Ghost with Seamus and Pat. And this time, Noel and Catherine are joining us. So they have a few questions. So guys, you can lead off. Go ahead. Oh, wow. First of all, hi, guys. This has been a great interview so far. Um, is Andy still on the line by any chance? No, uh, he's not, no. unfortunately. Okay. Well, maybe you uh, can answer the question for me. I mean, I continue to be amazed just by... How far out there you guys go tonally? I mean, it's just, it's amazing. And I'm so, such a big fan. Um, what he does with the vocals, I think, are just pretty astounding. Does he actually write the vocal lines? And how does he record them? Because that is just singing without a net, you know, how he pulls some of those notes out. Well, he, first off, he does everything in one take. In yeah, it's kind of crazy to see him in the studio. Yeah, he really does produce once we're in there. Yeah. Um, he lays down like a ghost vocal for our sake, and That's... and ninety percent of the time, like <laughs> the ghost vocal is is capable. <laughs> it's it's quite awesome to watch. Yeah, he's quick. Um, and yeah, he writes. He he's uh, quite good at hearing melodies that aren't there. So when when something happens, he kind of fairly quickly realizes what needs to be done, and especially for even like a lot of the the. Uh, the saxophone melodies are based okay. off things that he hears. Mm -hmm. Right, so he just reacts to the music then. More or less, yeah. yeah. He's got a lot of natural sense, and uh, yeah, and his musicality is a little unorthodox because, um, you know, it's not like he's a classically trained vocalist or something, you know, he's, he's very much... Uh, I don't know. It's it's, it's very it's in, if you don't know the rules, right? Then right. how can you break them, right? So he can, he just goes wherever he wants. That's exactly right. Yeah, I was wondering if he actually had laid down guide tracks or anything like that, but it's pretty impressive. Nolan, over to you. Hey guys, this is Nolan. <laughs> hey, hey Nolan. Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that one of the things that really impresses me about your music is the level of complexity, rhythmically and harmonically. Um, do you guys work off of charts or uh, demos, or how is that? How are your arrangements conveyed to the band? Um, I, I'm a chart guy personally, but uh, as far as as far as communicating with like a, a lot of these guys, like Seamus is is like my best friend as far as as musically speaking. I hate him besides music. I can't, <laughs> I can't fucking stand him. <laughs> like, just sitting beside him drives well, me nuts. Mutual. But musically, it's, it's amazing. We don't really have to speak much. It, it's just, <laughs> it works out. Um, for the most part, we just deal with like, uh, kind of the form of counting parts out and stanzas and we're all, we're all pretty well versed and as far as the tempos go, a lot of them happen fairly naturally. There's been a few tunes that that we had to spend a bunch of time on with like the five eight and seven eight and in strange visions. But besides that, it it kind of just happens fairly naturally. Like we don't really force anything. Like yeah, I'm a firm believer that if you force something, it's not really meant to be there in the first place, right? So 
So all the complexities yeah. and rhythm are just kind of, you know, like we will like we'll lose a quarter note somewhere, right? In a pattern. Yeah. You just cut it out in total. <laughs> or yeah. add one or, you know, just stuff like that. Yeah. And I mean, technically at that point, then you can just start adding all those, you know, if there's four bars with one dropped on the end, then you know it's like 15-4 or something if you want to think of it that right. way. Well, giant bar, right? I mean, cause... Yeah. Stanzas, kind of communicating in stanzas. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Cool. Very nice. Brian, over to you. Okay. Well, uh, my next question is actually, and then second, for the second part, is this goes to you, Seamus, because coming from uh, the House of Cards, from a blues rock band to the Gypsy Ghosts, who are kind of, kind of all over the map between like. Jazz, Calypso, and just uh, kind of your, all of your own. Now, how how have you felt that you kind of fit in and kind of given your part to this band? Uh, well, I I've been uh, kind of like the same school of thought as far as music is concerned as Andy. I feel like pretty close, and just uh, like I never like I'm a self-taught musician. Um, I've played for many years, and I've always been an avid listener. So. You know, I guess I, you know, after so many years, you just retain so many different musical phrases that you're familiar with. And, you know, I listen to a lot of jazz music. I listen to a lot of electronic, hip hop, everything. I try to take what I like from all of that and sort of combine it. So whenever there's a musical situation, I can kind of pull from it like a library, like an archive. So with this stuff, it's very, it's beat driven music for the most part. So the idea a lot of the times is sometimes you got to create sort of a, a sexy sort of delicate environment rhythmically right. and it's got to be more sensitive and then other times you need there to be a lot of energy and uh, momentum so you have to provide some very solid so it really boils down to a lot of good judgment and you need good meter to play in this band and uh, you know for it all to kind of work together you know now the other thing I had to <clears throat> want to mention as well is uh, just uh, from just checking out what background I could find on you, like i.e., like you know your house of cards and just go that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at it and just uh, talking to you, you play. Uh, you remind me a lot of, and I'm 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 relating this because I I read uh, uh, the Anthony Kiedis book from the Red Tobias Card issue, and remind me a lot of how Flea kind of started out with bass lines, you know, like constantly banging away and it doesn't matter what's going on you're just kind of having it kind of can you tell you can't go anymore and you know and it's such a such a huge change especially to the evolution of the band between uh pat's guitar styling and andy's vocals and you know bobby being back where he's at and bruce and the whole thing you know it just it's it's it's, it's a nice uh inception to the band because now you're adding that much more energy and like we were talking about before between tom being an animal man you, you you match him in just your styling so that's gonna 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 make you feel good and kind of uh give you a, a sense of uh um um a sense of uh, of being meaning like you know you belong here just because like this of what you're doing so give us a little bit about that i mean how have you felt that you think really kind of fit into this band i mean i know you talked about it a little bit but maybe if you had a bit more in depth of you to it well yeah so the best way to kind of, I suppose it, it all kind of starts too with knowing the members beforehand. Right. So that kind of gives me a little more of a comfortable bed to start with. And, uh, you know, as far as, I guess, like my role as a musician in any project I've ever been involved with was to fulfill a duty and to sort of do it the best taste and the best most practice possible as well and just trying to do it as best I can so you know the house of cards was more of a blues sort of thing and to be honest like that sort of that sort of style of playing doesn't really that doesn't quote unquote do it for me really right you know like things I do also you know I play with an experimental jazz band um you know and I do little short little festivals with them as well on the side and that sort of lets me practice more of like the more finer technical side of my playing but with this band it's about you know i think stamina and having good meter being able to count well and structuring the parts tastefully is very important so I, i've all you know since i've started i've just been kind of working on that constantly fair enough uh, now influence wise i know this is kind of putting you on the spot but if you can narrow it down to maybe like three uh it could be drummers be whatever uh who who would they be the three musicians uh well i would have to say 
well to include a drummer, Steve Gadd. Um, Steve Gadd was a huge influence on me when I started playing. Uh, listened to a lot of, you know, stuff like Chick Corea. And, oh, man. You know, like all the Return to Forever records. Uh, man, so many, like, oh, what? There's so many, so many that I can say. Uh, a lot of jazz stuff, a lot of jazz. Miles Davis, Pharaoh uh, Sanders, um, all that kind of stuff. And listen to it a lot. Frank Zappa was is huge, oh, man, huge for me. So it's you know it's it's and then you know on the other end like Kruder and Dorfmeister for the down tempo or the orb, uh, you know stuff like that. Like all the electronic stuff I like too. So it's all you know square pusher, you know. Oh, fair like, enough. All that kind of stuff. Absolutely. I know I have three things that can to add to that. First off, with the Orb, I remember the first time being introduced to them, and it was probably about '94. So yeah. I was like, I kind of middle, fluffy little clouds. Yeah, middle, middle high school, right? So I remember them, and uh, it was kind of interesting you brought that up. But as far as uh, German school, as far as jazz goes, like Korea and that sort of thing, there is one album, and I can recommend to everybody, and it's probably one of the best jazz albums I've ever heard, and it's live. It's John McLaughlin live. Yeah. But it's with Chick Corea and Pat Metheny. Yeah. Oh, holy, yeah. holy crap, man. That is the best album, jazz album I've ever heard in my life. Metheny like, is such a fucking monster. Like, it's just, it's kind of disgusting. Well, what, he, what he did at 21 years old, like, kind of, it's just, it's mind-boggling. Well, what well, he's but, doing now, too, like... Mm -hmm. His whole approach right now is crazy. He's a, he's a he's a med, like a, just a musical genius. I found that in 1996 at a at a music store. So lived in the U.S. for a little bit. A place called Harmony House, and I was in the jazz section. Like no way, I picked up and I man, that's one of the best albums I've ever heard in my life. But I uh, just just for that uh, keeping on jazz for just one second here. The other thing I want to mention too was uh, Charlie Hunter. Charlie Hunter is probably one of the, uh, he, he's a young jazz guitarist, he's probably in his mid 40s now, but he's a, a younger jazz guitarist and he uh, plays very differently than your, we'll call your your your, your uh, regular jazz playing, meaning like he's, uh, his, his uh, guitar is mixed up of uh, jazz, oh uh, sorry, of uh, guitar and bass strings. Mm -hmm. But the thing, that, one thing is too is, is he is very good friends with another person we know very well and he played on a song, it was a, a song named after him, this was 1998, it was uh, Les Claypool from uh, Primus, uh, the, uh, the album was called Highball for the Devil, it was his yeah. first solo album, and he did a song called Me and Chuck, and the song Me and Chuck was me and Chuck, and, 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 and Charlie Hunter. And so Charlie Hunter was on that song, and man, one of the best songs ever, and it just, it's, it's so uh, amazing to me how small yet big the musical community is. Oh yeah. Yeah, everything kind of also to a certain styles of music, it kind of works in a circle. You know, you have these collab albums like, say, Red Clay or something with Joe Henderson and Herbie Hancock, you know. Right. So, like, you find a few of these handful of musicians and you look, go and look up there. You know, you end up finding, like, hundreds of albums just that way, just by... Well, exactly, you know, man. The hip-hop community is the same way. Producer, MC, and... Just, That's right. Just, you just got to have the patience to kind of, kind of look and listen, right? Mm-hmm. So guys, uh, if you don't have another question, we're going to get to another song here. Do you guys have another question yet? Do we? Yeah. Oh, um, <laughs> actually, this is just sort of a generic question. Um, I hope this hasn't already been asked. Um, so on this album, what was the decision-making process on how to order the songs? Or was that, that that's conceptual a, from the beginning? Or That's a crazy question. We, we had a lot of, we flip-flopped a lot. Um, at first, I was like, I, they're they're all very creepy in a sense, uh, right? Totally like, but there's a lot of songs that are kind of they go in and out of each other quite nicely, and a lot of them are in the same key. So we were thinking about doing a bunch of overtures kind of thing. Like we had like a bunch of stuff in the same key, like Devil Disco and uh, Sea Fever are in the same key. So is uh, Drop by Drop. So we were kind of thinking about, you know, like having those be seamless. And then, and then at the beginning, like Madman, uh, Cuban, Hellhounds, all in the key is a C minor. So we kind of like tried to keep it <clears throat> in, in, it was very concept based for a lot of, a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff in the album we don't play live, you know, like we don't do Sea Fever or.